Well, that was cool. Uh, another fantastic talk uh, by Frank Krueger. Uh, always does good talks. I have to say, on my interest is peak. I haven't used OpenJS CAD before, and I am super interested. Up next, we have me, and I am going to be walking through creating a custom PCB today. And <clears throat> I am really interested in this talk. I'm excited to give it to you. I recently started churning custom uh, PCBs, and I have to say that in the beginning, I was a little bit intimidated by them, but it turns out that they're incredibly easy. You know, simple hardware like this that we're gonna do is incredibly easy to churn, and uh, modern supply chain for getting PCBs manufactured and assembled is, is, pretty, is pretty great, and in fact, you can actually assemble them at home. <clears throat> so, Today, we are going to cover, uh, first we're gonna answer the question, why even bother? Why bother creating a PCB? We're gonna talk a little bit about the general process of prototyping. So, um, <clears throat> you know, prototype, PCB, and, and, and that, that kind of flow. And then we're gonna do a, a walkthrough of actually creating a schematic for a PCB and then the physical PCB design. And along there, we're going to cover a little bit about component sourcing, and I'm going to give you some tips around that. And then we're going to finish it off with uh, practical at-home assembly. So you can actually assemble PCBs at home with tools that you probably already have, uh, which is pretty cool. <clears throat> First, a little context. Uh, what we're going to be creating today is this uh, is a, a custom wing for Meadow. It's uh, actually this apiarium board. And um, it is for a smart beehive that I've been creating. I, I keep bees at home and um, I wanted to make a smart beehive. And, and, and the Apiarium project, it is going to, it's, it's tracking a number of, of things. It tracks internal climate, temperature, and uh, humidity, as well as e external climate, temperature, humidity, and, and barometric pressure. Um, <clears throat> and then probably the most interesting thing about this is that it has a, a, a load cell, which is like a scale underneath, and that tracks the weight of the hive. Um, and this is uh, this is a great this is a uh, this is a great wing to build f with you folks because uh, sensor sensor tracking is a really common IoT use case. And uh, building as a wing that uh, that literally plugs into the meadow is a is a is a, a is a great way to actually prototype. And this is also a real world use case. This could potentially someone could take this and actually make an IoT product out of it, and, and you know, and potentially make a lot of money or you know, do interesting things. The last thing I'll say about this is that it also uh, because the meadow has an onboard battery charger. We can hook solar up to five volts and then you're just done. It has a battery circuit and stuff as well. So we're gonna have solar input on this. And <clears throat> the main thing that I wanna track here is, is uh, not just activity of the bees, what they're doing. Um, you can see here, this is that picture of data is actually weight data. And this comes from a SparkFun project. Uh, the folks over at SparkFun originally published this in Make Magazine and they had hacked a, uh, a beehive like this. And you can see this is their data and that was uh, the weight of the beehive. And, and you can see every day it drops as the bees leave and then over the day they kind of come back in and uh, the weight goes back up until they're all in there at night. The other, and the other interesting thing that you see there is that over time, the weight, the overall weight of the beehive goes up. And, and for me, I really want to, um, track, I wanna know when it's ready for honey harvesting. So I wanna know uh, when the weight has reached a critical level and it's ready to, to pull honey out. Uh, so that's that's kind of the main thing for, for me. But I also wanna know, um, you know, what's going on in the beehive in terms of uh, temperature and activity. I think that'd be really interesting to see. And, and I think it's important to answer the question, why, create a PCB, why even, why even bother? Well, it, the, there's obvious reasons which are, if you have uh, <clears throat> the custom industrial design 
and you need to fit within there, then you know you have to churn a PCB. Or if you're going to production, um, obviously you need to churn a PCB because it's not scalable to hand wire, uh, hand wire uh, your circuits up. But there's some other non-obvious things here, which is if you look at the two images here on the on this slide, these were actually my early early prototypes, and while they worked. The routing, the physical routing of all those wires was an absolute nightmare. Uh, it required, you know, it was kind of a puzzle and it was a lot of a lot of planning in my head how to get things routed and fitting on the board and stuff. And it turns out that churning a custom PCB was just a lot easier. I mean, the routing, first of all, is a lot cleaner and there's not wires ever going everywhere and whatnot. <clears throat> but it turned out to be so easy that there's no reason not to. It's also incredibly cheap. Uh, you can get these, you can get this, you know, five of these boards made for, for under 10 bucks. And that's, that's really just, I mean, that just, it, it just seals the deal for me. <clears throat> a note about prototyping. So uh, before you turn a custom PCB, you know, start with start with breakout modules. Um, start with with existing pieces, and 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 what I what I say here is okay. So, <clears throat> in my custom beehive, I've got a lot of different things I wanted to do. I want internal climate, I want external climate, and then I want this load sensor for weight, and then I'm adding other things later on. And and the key here is to break the problem into pieces. So. Isolate each one of those things that you want to do and solve for each one and get each one working using uh, pre-built modules. So uh, you can get uh, you can get these modules from uh, Adafruit or SparkFun and um, other places. And, and they already have, <clears throat> like in this case, internally I'm using an SI7021 temperature and humidity sensor. Now, both Adafruit and SparkFun have the breakouts for those sensors already built. And so I can take one of those, I can buy one of those breakouts, and I can plug it into my, my breadboard, uh, plug it into my meadow, and then I can start working with it. And I get it right, get it, make sure that works first, and then start churning uh, a circuit. <clears throat> and there's a number of advantages uh, of, around this. And one of the biggest advantages is that they solve the design for you up front. So you don't have to do that. And you can, when you actually turn the custom PCB, you can just use their design. Now, a note about sourcing these modules. Um, I, I love SparkFun and Adafruit products because they are high quality and they really, they, they build them with care. It, when, when I'm buying modules uh, from them, I know that they're gonna work. They're not gonna give me a lot of trouble. Uh, every once in a while, every once in a blue moon, I get one that's a failure, um, but it's very rare. On the other hand, you can also get, uh, you can get Chinese modules. Uh, uh, oftentimes, they're even knockoffs of these of the SparkFun and Adafruit ones off of AliExpress, eBay, Banggood. There's a number of sites, and and the thing to know about this is that they are optimized for price rather than quality. So you'll want to buy a lot of them if you if you actually go that route and know that you'll run into failures and that's just that's just part of the game. But they can be a, a, a good way to optimize your own builds for price, <clears throat> especially if you need a lot of them. Now, the, the process itself of creating a PCB is fairly simple. Uh, the first thing that you do is you lay down the design of the components on on like paper you know so you do a drawing of of all the components and the wires connecting them uh, and this is called this this schematic design you create a schematic and this schematic design is also known as schematic capture capture <clears throat> and then once you've done the schematic capture then the next step is to take that abstract design and turn it into a physical pcb design um, once once you have a design complete for the pcb then you output the drawing files, they're called Gerbers, and you send them off to get fabricated. And that's actually where they do the printing of the PCB. Uh, it's PCB stands for printed circuit board. And they, they actually print on there and then they use um, uh, acid to etch away the, the copper that, that shouldn't stay. Um, and sometimes they use laser, but, but that's the general process. And then, and then finally, you, um, once those PCBs have been fabricated, then you get them and you put your components on them and then you solder those components in place and that's called assembly. 
<clears throat> the tools that we use for schematic capture and PCB design are called EDA tools. And there's a number of them out there. Uh, here's some uh, free, uh, widely available ones that you can use uh, that are that that um, are pretty common. Eagle, Easy EDA, Fritzing, KiCad, Upverter. There's a number of others. There's also some very very expensive tools <clears throat> that are pretty good. Um, Altium, for example, is you know many. It's like I think it's more than ten thousand dollars a year um, per person. It's very expensive, but it's also you know top of the line. Today we're going to use Easy EDA. Uh, it's a very it's as the name says, it's very easy to use. I actually like this one best out of all of these 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 um, kind of free and available ones. Though I will say internally, uh, we use KiCad for our uh, professional designs for the Meadow boards, um, SMT stuff and whatnot. Um, that seems to be the favorite of our EE um, out of these and uh, and some other folks. But I just, you know, it's kind of a personal preference. The, the point is, is the things that I'm going to show you today generally apply to all of these. They're not a whole lot different. You know, the UX might be different. There's a, a few things that are different here and there, but generally they're they're kind of the same. Uh, all right, so let's actually build. Um, let's jump over into Easy EDA and get going. So this is. <clears throat> When you download and install Easy EDA and you open it up, it's going to look something like this. You're going to sign in. Uh, all their stuff is online, so it's up in their cloud. Um, and the first thing that we're going to do is go over here and we're going to create a new project. And let me share it this way so you can see my cursor. <clears throat> and I'm going to call this uh, APRM uh, uh, Demo. PCB. Now a project contains both the schematic library and uh, your, sorry, your schematic design as well as the PCB design as, as we'll see. So here it is, we've, uh, we've created the project, it creates a new folder and it automatically creates a new schematic in there and when you save it, it will show up here. Now, we're going to start building this thing and the first thing that we actually want to do is remember I mentioned that it's good to start with an existing with existing modules. And one of the reasons, one of the biggest reasons to do that is they've actually already solved the design for you. <clears throat> so whenever you get one of these modules, they should have uh, uh, a data sheet or a schematic that 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 are that's published along with it. Um, and then that can show you kind of how their modules work, uh, how their module is set up. And if you've got that module already working, then you know that this is a good, a good design. The other thing that that you'll want to understand is that uh, data sheets are your friend. Uh, this is the data sheet for the SI7021. This is Silicon Labs humidity and temperature sensor. And uh, when you're designing, you will live in data sheets because data sheets give you everything that you could possibly need to know about about the chips or the whatever component, including, uh, for example, here, it gives a typical application circuit. So this, you'll notice, looks a lot like this. <clears throat> we have the chip, um, the I squared C clock and data lines are on there. There's some resistors on those data lines. <clears throat> and there's uh, you know power and ground, etc. So it looks a lot uh, it looks very similar. Uh, in fact, it should be effectively the same design, maybe some minor changes. So let's pop back over to Easy ADA and and I want to start with a couple of things. Um, let's let's talk about Easy EDA as a UX. So uh, over here is the three main things that you'll be working in is your uh, your project uh, tab that shows all your projects. The EE lib will give you standard schematic symbols, uh, and then the libraries uh, tab here or overlay will actually give you an online catalog of of tens of thousands of of parts. And so 
the first thing I want to do is I'm going to start with my SI7021 and I can search for it and see here it is Silicon Labs it, that's the um, that's not right actually I got to click on this there we go uh, here's the here's the schematic <clears throat> the schematic drawing of the part uh, one thing to know about this software is that it it is uh, a Chinese software and so the language isn't quite right here so they call parts uh, libs and uh, lib and so there's schematic libs and PCB libs and uh, a lib is the a lib is the the part it's not actually um, it's it's not the um, it's not a library uh, so uh, just know that that's you know that's uh, that's what that means all right so back here I searched for SI7021 and um, here it is it shows me the schematic uh, drawing the PCB footprint this is uh, a footprint is actually um, what shows up on the board itself uh, on, so when the the exposed copper is uh, uh, is what the footprint is that's what the the component that will actually solder to and there's even a, um, a photo of it here <clears throat> so this is pretty nice we're gonna grab this and we're gonna say place so I'm gonna start with that I'm just gonna drop this here and the next thing that I know that I want is a meadow so I'm not actually gonna put a meadow in the uh, on the schematic, I mean on the PCB, but I am going to use all the Meadow I/O because I'm making a wing. And if you search for Meadow, there's a couple of boards in here. Uh, that <clears throat> there's actually three. There's one that uh, Stuart Johnson created as well. Uh, there's a couple that I created, and one has, uh, and you can see here, it has an outline of uh, the board, the Meadow board, and then there's one that it just has the headers. Now. Uh, I'm going to use the. I'm going to start with the one with the outline, and the reason why is because <clears throat> I'm creating a wing, and I just want to use that. I just want to be lazy, and I want to use that board outline for my wing. If I if I wanted to create a custom um, shape for my wing or whatever, I would use the one with the headers only, and then I would, when I did the schematic design, I would actually go in and uh, uh, lay those out. <clears throat> and we'll show. I'll show you how, kind of how that would work. Cool. So I have those two things in here. Um, at first, let's uh, let's take a look at this as the SI7021 chip, <clears throat> and let's get its connectors hooked up. So if we look at the design here over in SparkFun, or if we look at uh, the data sheet, we'll see that it's got a couple of things going on. Um, there's four pins. There's VDD. SCL, SDA, and ground. Uh, <clears throat> and you'll see the same things over here. D data and um, SC, those are I squared C, data, and clock. And you'll see both of those are actually pulled up to 3.3 volts. Now these are pull-up resistors. And the way that pull-up resistors work is that they provide like a default value to a line, to a wire. Yeah, if we so so digital signals uh, are either high or low, they're they're one or zero, and in order for them to be recognized as such, there's a, a narrow band of voltage in which they have to fall within uh, to be considered either high or low. And if we don't if we don't give them a default value, if we don't either apply power or we or we hook them to ground, then what happens is that they're floating and floating wires uh, act like antennas and so any electromagnetic interference or whatever can actually take the value of that line and can can make it kind of jump around and, and make noise and make it not make sense and digital circuits operate under very tight tolerances so we want to make sure that it's either one or the other and by pulling it up what we're actually doing is allowing a trickle of electricity uh, from three volts to power those lines <clears throat> so that whenever the chip either the SI7021 or the microcontroller the STM32 that's hooked to it wants to uh, send it low then it it hooks it to ground and then all the electricity dumps and it actually can can um, make a signal so it can actually drive they can still drive that signal up and down 
um, because the resistors are very, very, uh, they're, they're, they're a lot of resistance, which means only a trickle of electricity goes into there. So that's what pull-up resistors are. They're just default values. The next thing that we see here is a VDD, which um, is also the same as VCC, uh, which just means power. This is where power goes in, and you can see that it's hooked up to 3.3 volts. On the other end here, there's this uh, there's this symbol right here, and that's a capacitor. And you can see it's a ca it's probably a capacitor because it's a C2, um, and capacitors are often uh, prefixed with C, just as resistors are R, and it's 0.1 microfarad. Now what this does, this is a decoupling capacitor. This is also an incredibly common thing that you'll see in designs. Uh, <clears throat> as I mentioned, digital circuits have a very uh, limited range of uh, the, that they need to operate within. <clears throat> and this power here, this chip needs constant power. And a capacitor works like a, uh, a fast acting battery. So what happens is that if there's a power drop because we turn something on elsewhere and all the power and the power jumps to that or whatever, um, there can be like a little, there can be a dropout um, in the power. And what a capacitor does is as soon as it, as soon as there's, it senses that there's a, a dropout, it, it actually dumps its voltage into that line. And so it, it, it provides, um, it, it serves as a buffer. Um, to make sure that that is a constant power source. <clears throat> and this, as I said, this is called a decoupling capacitor. Now, there's, this is an I2C device. And one thing that I want to point out, because as you, if you're uh, working with I2C devices, one thing that's super, super common is that they will have an address. Um, they will have a, an, like a, you can change their address. Um, like for example, this is a BME 280 chip and this BME 280, uh, this is the breakout the, that SparkFun has. And this chip is what I'm using for the external part of the climate sensing. And it does temperature, humidity, and uh, barometric metric pressure. <clears throat> it also can work over I squared C or SPI. And in this case, this design has a couple of interesting things. There's a chip select pin where if you pull it up, as you can see here, pulls up the chip select line forcing I squared C mode. So if you're, if you're, if you're working with it like a BME 280, you're gonna pull that up um, to put it in I squared C mode. And then there's one other thing that I wanna talk about, uh, which is this address. So on the BME, BME 280, they have this pin that says SDO, uh, ADR, you can see it right here. And if you pull that pin high, in this case with right here, you see if there's a pull up resistor. Uh, so if you pull that up to 3.3, then that will be, there. it can be two, the I squared C um, chip can have two addresses, either 1110110 or 110111. So if you pull it high, this last bit gets a one. And if you pull it low, then um, it gets a zero. And what they've done is that they've got this little solderable thing where you can where you can cut this little lead here, and then you can solder these two things together to pull it to ground. Um, or but by default it's pulled up, so it gets the second address. So I just wanted to point that out because because that kind of um, uh, modifiable addressing is super common in I squared C things. So you might might see that. <clears throat> All right, fantastic. So we understand how this chip has got to be hooked up. Let's actually go and, and start hooking things up. So easy EDA. Okay, first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hook up ground and power. <clears throat> and I want um, these things to be connected. I want them to be uh, on the same ground, same power. So I'm gonna drop in VCC. This is actually, this is power. And I'm gonna do it over here next to this chip as well, next to the, sorry, next to the Meadow F7. And then I'm gonna drop in ground here and I'm gonna drop in ground here. Now, whenever you see something and it's named, those names indicate that these things are connected, even if they're not actually connected in the drawing. So let me show you what I mean by that. If I draw a wire uh, to connect these two, you can select this or you can hit W, um, hit W again, and I'm gonna connect, uh, these two things together. What this means is that 
physically, I need to have um, uh, on my on my breakout board, the power on here is actually gonna come from the meadow. So it's gonna hook the meadow three volt three to uh, the SI7, uh, SI7021 pin. <clears throat> and so what I've done here by giving these given these uh, common names, then I know that they're actually physically going to be hooked together. And you'll see later on uh, how that works. So there's that. I'm going to wire then uh, ground over here and I'm going to wire ground here. Okay, so we know that those are all hooked together. Uh, and then recall that we also need a decoupling capacitor for our power. And so, um, and that hooks to ground as well. Uh, so a couple of things to, to talk about here. Uh, a capacitor like this, we call these jelly bean components. Um, you'll see over here on the, on the left, there's these e, e, this EE lib. You could actually just grab uh, a capacitor from here and you could select um, the type of, uh, or the size of the component. Um, uh, or or the type you know there's they're different they're called footprints and you could uh, you could select that and then uh, rotate with R space and then drop that in and hook this up you know and, and wire them together and as long as you get the footprint right and now uh, a footprint is actually recall when we looked at this uh, when we looked at parts in the library <clears throat> a a footprint is actually the PCB lib, so that's what it looks like on the uh, on the circuit board itself. How, what the pads, the copper pads that are exposed are. As long as you get the footprint right for these jelly bean components, you can actually go in and you can use these and then add the actual component uh, name or uh, or part number later. However, I found that it's better, uh, at least in Easy ADA, to find your components in the very beginning um, and then add them that way. So let me show you how to do that. <clears throat> so here's my uh, here's my my browser and I want to on this I need uh, a 0 0.1 microfarad capacitor. So I can actually go in here and I can uh, I can search for that 0 0.1 microfarad capacitor and there's this site, Octopart, is really, really fantastic. There's also its uh, uh, a companion or its competitor site, OEM Secrets, is uh, very similar, does essentially the same thing. I, I tend to think that the Octopart UX is a little bit easier. Um, <clears throat> but in here, I search for this capacitor and then I get all these great, I get all these filters and um, I, can, I can search for uh, uh, different types and whatnot. Um, for capacitors, we're almost always going to use just a ceramic multi-layer capacitor. You don't need anything fancy. And then <clears throat> it shows you all the all the things that match that, all the different capacitors that match that. You'll see these are different foot different types, um, different footprints. Uh, and then also the availability, you can order from here and um, the price at different distributors. I think this is just really, really a fantastic uh, uh, tool. Now, I uh, want, this is basically what I want. I want this, um, I actually like Yagio a lot. I, I trust them. There's a, you know, uh, most of these, most of these uh, jelly bean components are, are pretty good. You don't have to worry about uh, quality, but you can actually s search through here and you can have, you can um, find a lot of different, uh, you can, you can, you can see a lot of different brands and you can see a lot of different form factors and whatnot. Um, this is the wrong footprint. I actually want an 0603 footprint. Um, now, a, a note about footprints about sizes the smallest size that uh, you want to hand try to hand solder is 0603 and and the way that these sizes break out is that there's it's a little confusing there's imperial side co size codes and metric size codes almost all the time when you see size size codes they're going to be in imperial and this is up on our website this is actually up in our doc site it's under um hardware circuits 
and then SMD packages and sizes. You see that the 0603, this is real size, this is actual size, is actually still very, very small. You don't want any smaller than this if you're trying to hand solder. Uh, you also don't generally want anything bigger than that because in the last few years, bigger components have gotten pretty scarce. As folks are moving to smaller and smaller circuits, um, manufacturers have started to make less of the larger components and so they're getting, they're starting to get scarce. In fact, a couple of years ago, it was almost nearly impossible to find a 0.1 microfarad capacitor, which is so, so common um, in a size bigger than like 0603. It was, it, they were like a worldwide shortage and it was, it was non-ideal. Um, so, you, so going back to Octopart here, I want a 0 0.1 microfarad capacitor, 0603 size. <clears throat> And so I can look through here and I can find different, uh, uh, different ones and whatnot. Uh, this, is, this is probably about as close as, I, as, as I'm gonna get. So um, Yagio, ceramic capacitor, I, you know, a lot of this stuff doesn't matter. Uh, all that really matters is the size, 0603, and that it's uh, uh, 0 0.1 microfarad. This one is actually, it looks like it's a 0 0.1 farad, which I don't want. Um, so here's one. Uh, Yagio, Motole, blah, blah, blah. This looks like it's about right, yeah. Um, so that's a good one. Um, I think this is the one that I had grabbed before. It's, it's the, it looks like it's the same one. Anyway, so I can, I can click on this and I can get more information and whatnot. In this case, I'm just gonna copy this and I'm gonna go back over to Easy EDA. I'm gonna go to the library and I'm gonna search for that. Uh, notice I have to right click on uh, and paste um, the hotkey for some reason doesn't work on Mac. I think this is you know, tested on Windows. Um, so here it is. There's actually my part. Uh, all looks good. And so I'm going to go ahead and place that. I'm going to put it here and then I'm going to wire it up just as I did before. <clears throat> okay, good, good, good. So far, so good. Next thing I want to do is uh, wire up I want to hook the I squared C lines, clock, and data. So if I grab a wire here, I can hook up clock, and I could just drag it over here, and uh, I could like try to route it around and um, uh, hook it up like that. And that's I would call non-ideal. Um, that would make if you if you wire it up like that, uh, your your drawing is going to be a mess. But remember. I, I mentioned that if you name something, then um, then anything with that name is connected. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go over here and we're gonna use a net port. And a net is uh, any like kind of wire, um, any wire uh, name. So we're gonna put one here on clock and we're gonna put one on here on data. <clears throat> and then we're gonna call it I squared C uh, clock and call this I squared C data. All right, cool. And now that we have those, I'm gonna actually select them and I'm gonna copy them and then I'm gonna put them over here because I am gonna <clears throat> hook the clock up here and I'm gonna do a little, let's do a little cleanup. Let's select these. <clears throat> Drag them over and then of course that's dumb, so we'll fix that. All right, and then I take this and spin it with space and hook it up to uh, the data there. Now we have those two are connected together and we also need those, the pull-up resistors. Remember that um, those data lines, the I squared C lines actually need to be pulled up uh, to get a default value. So I'm gonna drop these in over here and then uh, I'm gonna pull them up to, to VCC. Um, oops, delete that. Now, uh, I need a couple of resistors. I can go over to Octopart and search again for uh, what I need. Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to bother you with that again. Uh, I already know the part uh, by looking through there. I'm just gonna paste it in here. Um, <clears throat> here it is. It's a. It's a, a Yagio. You can see it's uh, 4K7 means 4.7, and it's no 603 uh, resistor. So I'm gonna put those in, uh, rotate, 
rotate and then want W for wire. And let's uh, connect that up. And here we are connected and then here to here and here to here. All right, looking very good, very good. Now, one thing about this that you might notice is that in we, when we looked in the data sheet for the SI7021 and also in the SparkFun thing, here we only see four lines, uh, four connectors. And in the data sheet, we actually see four connectors as well. <clears throat> However, if we scroll down a little further, and um, this will give you, there's an actual pinout. And you can see that it does in fact have six um, plus this thing, six uh, leads plus this thing in the middle. DNC means do not connect. And it says here, these pins should be soldered to pads on the PCB for mechanical stability. They can be floated, floating or tied to um, power. Do not tie to ground. That's really interesting because I think I would have by default tried to tie them to ground. And then the other thing that we see here is EXP. I think that's like external pad or something. Uh, that's this this thing in the middle, I'm pretty sure. That's, you know, process of elimination uh, comes up with that. So do not connect. Uh, all right, let's not connect them. There's this thing called a no connect flag. And we'll put that in there, put that in there, and put that in there. So this looks pretty good. Um, our design, our schematic design is just about done. There's one other thing uh, that I wanna put in, um, and that is, I wanna put in, um, on the design, I wanna put, uh, let me show you on the uh, picture of it here. I want to put a little connector, a little terminal mount. You can see this thing right here. Um, I want to put a little, this green thing, I want to put a little terminal mount, screw terminal for uh, my solar power coming in. <clears throat> and then that's going to hook to the five volt pin uh, on the on the board. So switch back to uh, my PCB view. And let's go and search for uh, that part. Again, I used Octopart to find this. Um, but this is what I want. I want this, um, I want, uh, let's see if we can find a decent, uh, this one, will, you'll notice that when I search for this part, this um, uh, the terminal mount, I get a bunch of uh, a bunch of parts in here that folks have um, actually created, but only some of them have uh, both a PCB uh, component and the, uh, and the schematic component. So you might want to look around for something that suits your fancy. Uh, I actually, this one's pretty good. I like that one. Um, ah, I've actually favored it. So you know that I, I liked that one before. <clears throat> and this is really just a preference, like the difference between that and this. I just don't like that wire up uh, because when you have terminals like this, oftentimes you have more than two. And so when you put them in a line like, uh, like this, then uh, they're, uh, uh, just a lot easier to, um, uh, you know, it's more consistent. All right, so switching back over. So I'm gonna place that, I'm gonna put that here, and then I'm gonna hook, one of these is gonna go to ground. So we hit uh, wire, and then we'll wire that up. And then the other one of these actually needs to go to f the five volt pin on the meadow board, because that's, how you power from solar. You actually plug it into the five volt rail and then that goes through the voltage regulator which outputs 3.3 um, to the board and also outputs like four volt to, volt, volts ish to the battery um, through the battery charging circuit. Cool, looking pretty good. So next thing we wanna do is it's time, we're gonna save it and it's time to create our PCB. So if we go up here and we choose convert to PCB, <clears throat> it's gonna ask us if we wanna check nets, and then it's gonna say, hey, 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 what's going on? Um, incomplete net, uh, a complete net should contain two or more pins. If you design it on purpose, please ignore this, this uh, warning. And so if you click on this, it's actually gonna show you what these are. The issue is that it knows, it wants you to, it wants you to be specific, either connect these or say don't connect them. So 
uh, we're actually going to go through and put in do not connects on these because we're not connecting it to anything in our circuit. So, oops, missed that one. All right, so those are in, and then these are in. Cool, there we are. Uh, so this do not connects are in. And what is happening over here? Let's uh, let's fix that. Let's get that connected. Um, cool. Now it looks pretty good. If we refresh this, then those should actually go away. And then um, the rest of these are just showing you uh, where these uh, nets are. Uh, so you've, uh, it, it's just a nice way to see kind of where everything is. All right, so now we're gonna convert to PCB. Oh, it says please save, right, right, right. Convert to PCB. And here we are, here is our initial PCB design. Now, there's a couple things here. Uh, this grid is uh, so distracting. The first thing I do is change it to a dot. Uh, and now you'll see there's two, these purple things are outlines. It gives you one uh, that you could put you know, your components on. There's also this one, which we recall from earlier, I imported, um, I imported a meadow design that actually had uh, in its PCB lib, uh, it actually had the outline and stuff. So I'm gonna use that instead of this one. Um, so I'm gonna select this one and delete this. Next thing I'm gonna do is change my, um, my units and my grid. You're oftentimes switching around quite a bit actually in units. Um, mills are uh, thousandths of inch of an inch um, and an inch of course is metric and then there's a millimeter. I usually design my boards, um, the outlines and stuff in, in metric because um, all of my designs, uh, my enclosures and stuff I do in metric. But the most of the components themselves I lay out in inches and the reason why is that if we actually look at this, this is just the standard. These are 0.1 inches apart each one of these header things um, these are 0 0.1 inches apart and that's just you know historical legacy stuff uh, also known as 100 mils so you can work um, in like mils or inches uh, and the next thing i'm going to do is that i'm going to go in and, and change my snap a little bit these snap sizes don't make any sense alt snap is actually you hold down all and you get a more fine snap but you notice it's the same size as, as regular snap so i'm going to go in and and uh, uh, change it to uh, so 0.1, and then I'm going to do 0.05, and then we'll do uh, 0.01, uh, and that's pretty good for me. All right, I'm going to move this to the origin. I'm just going to, you know, that's clean just to put it on the origin there. And now we want to uh, place our components. I'm going to put my my uh, solar. Uh, plug in over here someplace. It's going to be kind of up near the edge. And then I'm going to put my SI7021 over here. <clears throat> and then I need to get my capacitors and stuff um, kind of over here in this, in close to it. Now there's a couple of things that, that are going on on this board. Um, you can see all of these blue lines are unrouted uh, nets. And if we look at this SI7021, you see there's clock and there's data and then there's the other things. Um, those actually need to be, they need to run over here. Uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna rotate this. I'm gonna select this part and I'm gonna rotate here. And then um, I'm gonna get these things kind of in the right spot. We know that the resistors are pulled up on those two, uh, on those two nets. So I'm gonna put this one uh, maybe like kind of here. You can use Alt for a little finer and then I'm gonna put this one next to it. And then recall that this capacitor, this decoupling capacitor has to hook to, uh, <clears throat> has to be next to uh, pin five. Uh, and we can see that back over here, it's, uh, it's pin five. And uh, this is interesting, it's actually, you know, VCC is actually connected. It just has to be, you just want it next to it. Uh, think of electricity as pipes and all this is plumbing. Um, you want the the pressure to be taken care of as close to the pipe, as close to the place that's used as possible. So we're going to rotate this be like so, or just place it there. And then I'm going to do a little cleanup here. I'm going to grab this, um, and I'm going to I'll just put it here. 
Uh, and then I'm going to put I'm gonna just put this one here. And then, oops, and then I'm going to move these uh, these labels around a little bit. So they're there. Okay, cool. Now that I've got my components basically placed, it's time to start routing. Now, the thing that we want to do is we're going to do signal routing first. So these means signals are, you know, not ground or power. And recall that I've got clock and I've got I squared C clock and data. Um, so if I hit, if I choose uh, wire here or hit W just as before, I can actually just route directly to them. So I'm going to put some wires to there for the pull-ups and then they've got to go to these headers so I can route from here and I can do to there now we've got a problem um, I want to get this and I want to put it over here but I can't cross this wire uh, so it's remember it's a 2d space but I can put it underneath so what I can do here is uh, I can I can drive a uh, a little tunnel through the board called a via. So if I put a via, uh, if I if I put a via here, then um, I can wire to that via, and then that via will actually uh, go through the go through the bottom of or go through the whole board. So let's see. I'll put um, I'll put a via right here, and then I've got to name it. So it has to have the same uh, name as the net. So we're going to say. Uh, I squared C uh, clock uh, magic strings so be careful and then I'm going to wire this to there uh, and then from there I'm going to run this over to uh, oops uh, so that's on the top of the board now I've got to switch to the bottom of the board to get to the other side and then I can wire this over to that pin so there you have if we look at it at the bottom of the board there's that running to there so that's good uh, now I switch back to the top and the next thing that I need to do is that I need to uh, route my 5 volt um, to uh, this pin over here. So 5 volt coming in from solar has to go over to this pin uh, and so I'll route that. Okay, good, good, good. Now we're effectively done with the signal routing but we still have um, these things these wires, these unrouted uh, nets kind of floating around. <clears throat> but they are ground and power. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to pour copper on the top and the bottom uh, where there aren't already wires. And that's going to have uh, ground um, on top and, or, sorry, ground on, on, on bottom and, and power on top. Now the rule here is that you want to lay your ground plane on the opposite side of your major parts, <clears throat> which means on top would be your power plane. So what we're going to do is while we're on top, we're going to say copper area. We're going to choose VCC, which is our power. <clears throat> we'll uh, left click. Oops. Let's let's start that over. Um, copper area, VCC, left click, left click, left click, and right click to close. And that will pour, um, a, you know, your copper, and that's all going to be power. So we notice, like a bunch of those uh, unrouted nets disappeared, and that's because they're now connected. Because if we look at here, we scroll in, you see this VCC is actually hooked to this uh, line here. Uh, this blue is because the ground isn't isn't routed. Um, and and uh, likewise, if we go up here. And we look in this. Uh, this is the three volt three header, and it's also connected to, to VCC. Cool. So now we have that. Um, oh, come on, mouse. You can work. We're gonna we're gonna draw our pour our uh, copper plane. So we're gonna switch to the bottom, change to ground, and then again left click, left click, left click, right click. All right. Now we poured that, um, and let's switch back to the top. One thing that we what that has happened is that, that the ground is still unrouted. Um, and that's because the ground is on the other side. So just like before, we're gonna do a via. So I'm gonna put I'm just gonna put a via, I'm gonna put this via right here. And then um, it retains the name of the, the net name of the last one that we used, which we don't want, so we're gonna change that to ground, and you see it automatically says, Oh, ground is that's I can connect to that. So let's wire to that. Um, oops, that's the wrong size. 
uh, Robin side. Select the, the um, no, I'm sorry, that was the right. Uh, so we're gonna wire to that. And now there's a problem. This is actually interfering with uh, the copper on top, which is the, the power. So over here in the black area, we right click, do copper area and rebuild all. And what that does is re-pour that copper around those uh, nets. So there's one more, it looks like one more thing that needs to be, uh, one more ground that needs to be routed. So we're gonna put this in here, uh, run a wire to it. And then again, uh, right click, copper area, rebuild all. All right, fantastic. That's uh, effectively our board. Um, note that the ground over here is already connected because it goes through, you know, that's a through hole. The last thing I wanna do is I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna switch to the silk layer and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna name this or I'm gonna give it a, a label. I'm gonna call this APRM and we'll, uh, oops, we're gonna rotate that and then I'm gonna give it a nice font and uh, I'm gonna make it maybe a little bigger, uh, maybe a little bigger, yeah. And then I'm gonna do uh, one other thing that's super important is I'm gonna drop in uh, a revision. So I'm gonna call this rev 1.a. And now uh, I'm gonna make that a little smaller. Um, oops, grab the one, uh, wrong one, not that. Here we go. Uh, so we're 0.1 uh, APRM rev 1a. Awesome, so that is our board. If we wanna, we can take a look at it. Here's photo view. Uh, what's really cool is you can go in and do 3D view, and uh, there it is. That's what our board will look like when it's um, when it's when it's created. You can even see there's uh, little models of the components that are on there and whatnot. That's pretty neat. Cool. Um, so it's time to get this board made. So what we need to do is we need to export Gerber's. As I mentioned before, Gerber's are the drawing files. If you click this G up here, it's a generate PCP fab fabrication file with Gerber. I ask you if you wanna check the design rule constraints. You say, yeah, yeah, let's check them. If there's no errors, it'll automatically pop up um, with this. And from here, you can, you can actually order directly from uh, JLC PCB. And uh, JLC PCB is a uh, a Chinese PCB house and uh, for uh, boards like this, for simple boards, uh, two layer boards, they're absolutely great. They're cheap and the uh, quality is fantastic. So if we click that, um, it will actually go in and um, you can actually, it'll automatically upload your Gerbers and uh, create an order for you. As you can see, uh, it's very, very cheap the, with the default setting. So this is, uh, $7.40 to have this uh, uh, shipped to me. We can make it uh, even cheaper by, um, oh, $20, but that's because I chose Enig. We can actually make it a lot cheaper by using, uh, uh, oh, they popped in, our, our Gerbers. We can make it cheaper by uh, changing our surface finish. So uh, there's uh, some options here that we should talk about. So surface finish, uh, Hassle and, and Enig are the two major ones that, that you'll be using. Um, you don't want with lead, you want to do uh, lead free. Uh, Rose, which is uh, reduction of hazardous uh, substances. Uh, so Hassle is hot air solder leveling and this just means that the, uh, the board will come back with all the pads will already have uh, kind of solder, a very thin layer of solder on it. Or Enig is uh, immersion nickel something gold and that's um that will have gold plating on all the contacts on the contacts the solder pad so if you see here this is actually an enig plate um so that's all gold uh if you choose the hassle um it's all going to be silver and the hassle uh, option is considerably cheaper so from 18 dollars with enig to uh like uh, well, if it ever pops up, it's like seven dollars with um, with hassle. Uh, I've I've heard that this hassle is a little easier to solder on. I haven't actually found that to be the case. I almost always get Enig because they're just higher quality. Uh, also, a note about the color of the PCB. The one that I showed you is black. 
Uh, that takes an extra two days. If you want to do green, then it, it turns around in, in 24 hours. I almost always do black. Uh, the rest of this stuff, you shouldn't have to really monkey with much. Um, you can choose your PCB quantity. M make sure to just choose the lowest um, the lowest quantity on your early revisions because no doubt you will make changes. I have ordered and then made changes five minutes later, uh, ordered more, and then 10 minutes later, ordered more akin. So I went through re three revs and, and they churn so fast that, that you can't even cancel. Um, so anyhow, uh, yeah, choose the lowest quantity and um, 1.6 millimeter uh, PCB thickness is standard and the rest of this stuff I wouldn't even, I wouldn't worry about. Cool, so you can actually order that from here. You saved a cart and uh, it will, uh, it will, uh, you'll, and it'll order. Um, and a week later, you'll get your your board back, and it will be time to to solder. So, uh, all right, we have designed our PCB. We went through schematic design, we went through PCB design, and we ordered the board, and uh, it's been mailed to us. So now, what do we do? A couple of things that I want to run uh, quick through here. Uh, this is really more for reference later on. Um, Ger as I mentioned, Gerbers are the output files. Uh, Gerb V is a Gerber viewer. So if you download that, you can actually look at those drawings. Uh, the suppliers that we use, uh, JLC PCB, I just use them for all of my uh, kind of uh, easy, simple PCBs. For more complex PCBs, which uh, generally you won't even have to worry about, but if you're doing high-speed signal routing and stuff and you need a, a custom... Uh, custom stack up, which is a you know multi multi layer PCB with like you want to specify how much copper and width and size. Uh, I wouldn't worry too much about that. But uh, Rush PCB in San Jose or Toronto is fantastic. And then when you go to production, you want production quantities of your PCB. Uh, PCB Unlimited is is really they've been great to us. They're really fantastic. I mentioned uh, fabrication options, Hassle versus Enig. Uh, and and ROHS is pronounced rose, and it's just a re re restriction of hazardous substances. So it's like lead free, and other you know bad stuffs aren't in there. Now for assembly, you've got some options. You can pay someone. You can pay an assembly house, and um, for complex boards, that's the way to do it because they have pick and place machines that are robots that go and grab all the components and 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 place thousands of them uh, an hour. Um, those are really fantastic for complex boards. For simple boards like this, you can actually build it at home uh, pretty easily. There's a few options to consider. Uh, we're gonna we're actually gonna look at how to do a hot plate solder, which is I find is the the easiest and the best overall for this type of uh, 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 board where all the components are up on top. You can also hack a reflow oven, um, so you can take a, to a toaster oven and you can uh, you can put a, a temp. Uh, temp controller on there and you can uh, do your own hot hot air reflow where uh, you bring you put your your uh, your board in there with your components and your solder and you bring it up to temp and it'll actually um, melt it uh, like a much more expensive oven and that's okay uh, in fact it's necessary for boards with uh, components on both sides so you actually would have to do something like that but for these these types of boards the hot plate will work just fine the other thing that you can do is use a hot air rework station and that blows hot air out of a little nozzle and then that will heat up the components and melt this melt the solder um, you, you know you can use that as well I've done that uh, with some success but it it's really impossible for certain types of components and um, it's really prone to errors. So I, I would stay away from that almost entirely. Instead, I would, I would do the hot plate. And uh, to get a good hot plate, you can actually get one off of Amazon for about 70 bucks. You'll also need solder paste, which costs uh, about $10. Uh, and then some tweezers for component placement. So you can actually, the equipment, to do a real, you know, the nice, nice equipment to do uh, uh, to to solder these uh, can cost about eighty-five dollars, or you can do one of these hot plates, the kind of hot plates that uh, you make your tea on, uh, and that costs you know fifteen, eighteen bucks on Amazon. So it's you know overall you're looking at like just thirty dollars to be able to assemble. PCBs at home. Uh, the the one thing about a hot plate like this is that you know it'll take a lot of trial and error getting the uh, the temperature right and whatnot. So 
if you can, I, I recommend shelling out, you know, the 70 bucks for like a professional hot plate. Now, the, the process of actually doing this is very easy. You take your syringe of solder, uh, you put the little, uh, little syringe tip on there that has a, a very small aperture, and you sprit just a little bit of solder um, on each of the pads. And the trick here is not to do too much. You'll find out, you'll find that if you put too much, they start bridging, which means the solder um, um, actually will melt and connect multiple connectors, and you don't want that. So it just takes a very little bit of solder, and then with your tweezers, you actually place the components, um, put them in place, and you don't have to get it perfect. It's actually very forgiving. You put it in there, put them on there, and as the solder melts, it actually, the, the uh, surface tension will suck those components down into the, down into the right um, orientation. So uh, bring your hot plate up to about 180 degrees. Uh, that's also what you want your temperature at in your oven if you're doing a reflow oven. And then you place your assembled board on there uh, with, uh, uh, with your tweezers because the hot plate's gonna be very hot. Uh, and uh, that has a components on it in your solder. And then you bring it up to whatever your solder melt temp is plus 10, 20 degrees and, and watch it. You'll actually see the solder will go from a dull, a dull gray liquid um, to a bright shiny liquid and then you uh, that means it's melted um, the flux has lowered the temperature of the solder it's melted and, and um, then it's ready to go so just turn off the hot plate and let it cool for like 10 10 minutes and uh, pull it off and you're done it's very easy and it's like I said it's 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 very forgiving so thanks for uh, sitting through that that was uh, you know how to create a custom PCB uh, we have a little bit of time for uh, for Q and A. Uh, let me switch over to that camera, and we'll get going.